So I'm a fellow and director of the studies in history at Corpus. Um, so what does a director of studies do? They are an academic tutor that arranges the teaching and monitors the progress of a student while they're at Cambridge in terms of the academic side of things. Um, and a fellow is a member of academic staff at a Cambridge college that teaches students. Um, so um, my area of expertise is economic history, ec economic history and political history, particularly as it pertains to financial crisis and economic crises. Uh, so I've recently published two books. Um, my first one last year was a book about the Irish famine, which I'll talk more to you later in this presentation about. And my second one is a history of banking crises over the last two centuries. Um, but before I get on to uh, the main content of my presentation, I wanted to um, encourage you to apply to Corpus um, and also do a quick explanation of particularly why apply to for history at Corpus compared with other colleges. Um, so there are many, many reasons why you should consider Corpus to study history. Firstly, we have lots of beautiful old buildings, which not all colleges are blessed by. There are some newer colleges, um, there are some older colleges. Um, we also are relatively blessed to be relatively rich as a college, so we can give very generous grants and bursaries to students, which some other colleges are not able to afford, uh, which makes studying at Corpus uh, particularly affordable compared to some other colleges and certainly other universities. Um, we have a um, perfect location in the centre of town. Um, so some of you might be, uh, aware of or have heard of King's College Chapel, um, one of the most famous buildings in, in Cambridge. Well, Corpus is basically on the same street, almost directly opposite. And we also are home to the Corpus clock, which is depicted on the bottom left of this picture, uh, with lots of tourists around it taking pictures. Um, um, so, we are right in the middle of town. All the shops you could possibly want are within a minute or two walk away. And we are perfectly located as um, halfway, um, as only about you know, 10 minutes walk um, maximum from the arts and social science, main arts, humanities and social sciences site. Um, the science sites are even closer, some of the science sites are even closer than that. So we are perfectly located in the centre of town for everything a student would need. And also very excitingly, um, several years ago in 2020, we launched the bridging course. So we expanded our number of places by about 10%. And we reserved those places for students from widening participation of backgrounds. Um, and we give them a, if those selected for that course, basically who are selected on the basis of having lots of potential, but having educational disadvantage in their past, um, get a summer school before they arrive in Cambridge in order to help smooth their transition between school and university. And that's a very, um, popular course among the students who are on it they absolutely love love going on it so I uh, do consider applying to, corp to corpus for that and we're also one of the few colleges which have actually expanded our number of places since covid in that the university as a whole has had a significant rise in the number of applicants but corpus is one of the few colleges which is committed to increasing student numbers in the medium and long term why else apply to Corpus though? Well, you can take a look at most colleges, how much they're committed to teaching a subject by looking at how many specialists in that subject they have. Um, and Corpus is blessed by having a lot of different historians covering all sorts of periods. So to do a quick run through, we have Philippa Hoskin on the top um, left, who is our Parker Librarian. Um, we also have Shruti Kapila, who is a specialist in 20th century Indian political thought. We also have Amar Sohal, who's also an um, expert in 20th century Indian and 
global political thought. We have Dr. Emma Sperry, who is a specialist in cultural history of Europe in the 17th, 18th century, 16th, 17th, 18th century. Um, we have Sam Zeitlin, who is a specialist in political thought from the 16th and the 20th century. So he both looks at uh, the Elizabethan era and uh, the political force of Francis Bacon, as well as Carl Schmitt and um, Nazi political thought in the 20th century, which is an interesting mix of subjects. Patrick Succi is a medievalist. We have Barrett Kushner, who is a East Asian expert. We have the master of the college at the moment, who is Christopher Kelly, who is a professor of ancient history and works on Roman history and particularly late Roman history. So he recently within not too long ago wrote a biography of Attila the Hun, um, say, um, commenting positively, I believe, on his leadership style. He used to share an office um, with Mary Beard, um, a ancient historian from Cambridge who many of you might remember from television. And of course, we have Jesus, who will be giving the second talk today, who is an expert in the Spanish and Latin American world and the abolition of slavery in, um, in that part of the world. We also have the Parker Library. So this is super special. So this is something that most Cambridge colleges, if not virtually all, don't have, a, which is a special collection library, um, which has things that you cannot find elsewhere. So this is different from an undergraduate library, which has the main textbooks for most of the major courses. The Parker Library is a special collections library. It has objects, very old objects, very old manuscripts, which you won't find elsewhere. So this was founded by, an, uh, master of the college from the 16th century called Matthew Parker and he collected up the manuscripts which used to be stored in the libraries of the monasteries which Henry VIII had, um, had dissolved earlier in that century. He collected them up and basically nationalised them and then gave them to the college to look after and each year Several other colleges come to inspect the manuscripts to make sure we haven't lost any. If we lose too many of them, we forfeit the whole lot. So this is why we have never lost a Parker manuscript. And there are some really super special things here. The most special of all is probably the Augustine Gospel. So these are the gospel books given by the Pope to St Augustine of Canterbury when he came to Anglo-Saxon England in 597 AD to convert the pagan Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. Um, we also have the Psalter that the basically the, um, uh, the, the book that Thomas Beckett was holding when he was um, when he was um, when he was um, murdered slash executed by Henry II's knights. Um, and we even have the invoice from the execution of Thomas Cramner um, managed to get mixed into the collection at some stage. And the thing about studying history of cor at Corpus is that you could actually touch and feel and uh, you know go and see these books, arrange to go and see these books. Most students at most universities, you know, we can't, got, uh, can't, won't basically have an experience like that. Whereas at Corpus, they go and see the Parker Library on the very first day and get to touch up an eighth century Bible on their very first day studying the subject. Um, so I think that's enough about um, why you should study history at Corpus. And if you've got any more questions about that, you're also welcome to talk about that um, or ask me questions about that in the Q&A session at the end of the session. Um, but why is the Irish famine important in the history of not only Ireland, but the history of Britain? Well, what was the Irish famine? So this is a famine in the 1840s um, in Ireland, uh, which started when Phytophorin festans appeared in Ireland. So that's potato disease, which destroys the potato crop in 1845. Um, it, there was also a reoccurrence of an old disease, dry rot, and excess mortality lasted till about 1852, 1853. It is among the worst economic and humanitarian disasters in the modern history of the British Isles. 
probably the worst since the Black Death. We would have to go back to the Black Death to find something equally as that killed a greater share of the population of the British Isles and also had as great an impact in the history of these isles. So the scholarly consensus, although there are some arguments about this, um, uh, the Irish population fell by a quarter in five or six years, a million died, a million and a half emigrated. There are some scholars who say that there might be more emigration and fewer deaths than that. There are some who say there was less emigration and more deaths than that. Um, but the people agree that the population of Ireland fell by a quarter in about five or six years. And Ireland, has, Ireland and its population has basically never recovered from that demographically. So there's fewer people living in Ireland, the island of Ireland today. There's about 7 million living there today compared with 8.5 probably in the middle of the million in the middle of the 1840s. And it's the only country level area of Europe which has lower population now than it did in the 1840s. So other places which have suffered famines or genocides in Europe have recovered their population, but Ireland hasn't. And there are also political consequences from this, it, you know, the famine and um, accusations that Britain, um, Britain's response to this was inadequate, has uh, fueled Irish nationalism and a desire for Irish separatism, contributing towards Irish independence in 1922. Um, and there is a debate over the Irish famine. And the reason why I'm giving you a talk on this is because it's a good example of where there is debate in history. The Irish famine in many sources is presented as a single narrative of, of events. But research since the 1990s has reopened the academic debate on this subject. And the reason why I've chosen this as a topic is because the history at university, particularly about at undergraduate level, is all about arguing which narratives of an event or a set of events are most convincing. So rather than school where you're sometimes presented with a single narrative event, this is what happened, this is what caused the dissolution of the monasteries, this is what caused Henry II to send his knights to kill Thomas Beckett, Instead, there's lots of different interpretations provided by different historians. And the core of what you do as an undergraduate historian is read these different accounts and think about which ones are more and which ones are less convincing. This is particularly true earlier in the course, whereas later in the course you are let loose more on primary sources and you're able to produce your own interpretations of the past. But to start off, um, you look at different arguments about how or why an event occurred and the arguments and the evidence historians present and your job as an undergraduate historian is to say which one, which interpretations are less convincing and which interpretations are more convincing. And it is not enough to state what the narrative is. Of course, there has to be a clear sense of what you think the right narrative is, but you have to prove it and show why that interpretation or your argument is more convincing than the other interpretations or other possibilities um, that could answer the question. Um, so history is all about debate and all about explaining clearly and in a uh, logical way, why one side is less convincing than the other, using historical method as the means to do so. I mean, historical methods as in applying things, um, historic features of historical research, such as objectivity, as far as that's possible, rather than um, you know, other sorts of methods, such as um, being ideologically driven and deciding that one side must be right because um, you know, you're a dialectic Marxist or um, you, know, you believe that capitalism can never be faulty or you know, there's lots of different um, ide ideologies which can infiltrate history. But your job as a historian is to use historical method as far as possible to come up with that judgment. So um, the traditional debate in the, his in the histories of the Irish famine is between the nationalists, the revisionists, and um, the post-revisionist consensus, which has developed since the 1980s. So um, the nationalists, since the 
1860s argue basically um, put the culpability for the famine on the British government and say it was intentional um, mass murder. Um, genocide hadn't been invented in the 19th century, that's a mid 20th century word based on the shared characteristics of uh, the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews and the Armenian Genocide. Um, but nationalists since the mid 20th century have been applied to genocide to what occurred during the Irish famine. Um, to quote John Mitchell, who first popularised this interpretation of the Irish famine and the British government's culpability for it, he argued that the Irish famine is an artificial famine. Potatoes failed in a like manner all over Europe, yet there is no famine saved in Ireland. The Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but the English created the famine. Now, um, the nationalist view of the famine is not particularly well thought of, or virtually not thought of well by virtually any um, academic specialists on the Irish famine, either in Britain or Ireland anymore. Um, there are several reasons for this, in that um, it's no worth noting that John Mitchell wasn't a historian. He wasn't trying to use historical method or objectivity. He was a journalist trying to make a, um, a, a set of cheap points against the British government. And if you go back to what he was actually writing during the famine about what he was thinking was causing the famine or making things worse in Ireland is very different from what he was writing in 1861. So in 1861, it might have all been about the British government deliberately using laissez-faire to reduce the Irish population. In the 1840s, he actually, um, is some of his articles were accusing the government of taxing the middle classes and using that money to feed um, the poorest in society, which he tended to oppose because he argued the middle classes was a group of people in society which was wor most worth cherishing by the government. So to later accuse the British government of not feeding people when he was actually arguing that at the time um, seems a bit of a cheap point. It was also worth noting that um, he was a vicious anti-Semite who blamed at one point the international Jewish bullionist conspiracy for the Irish famine. Um, he also went to America later in his career and was a campaigner for slavery. And those um, in Ireland who seek, want to decolonize the curriculum and challenge previous interpretations of the Irish history have pointed out, actually, this person has a very problematic legacy in terms of being pro-slavery, in terms of being a racist, and why are there so many memorials around Ireland to him? And indeed, pointing out why are you know, the ideas he introduced into the historical of the Irish famine so, so common still. So it's worth thinking about the context in which these arguments develop, rather than taking just because somebody said something in past doesn't necessarily mean it is true, it is convincing, it is balanced, or that people are using historical methods to reach the conclusions they do. Um, one further point which came from, very much came from Mitchell and has been developed since into almost an Irish folk, folk story or folk, 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 um, folk, folk tale is the role of Charles Trevelyan, the permanent secretary to the treasury. Um, in the Irish nationalist interpretation, he's the person who is um, not only the person running the British response to the famine, he was almost architect, dictator and implementer of the policy. Um, uh, this was because the cabinet um, forced him to be the, person, the named person on um, some of the government's defences of what they were doing during the famine, which were instead were co-authored by the government. Um, and um, more recently, people have said that, um, such as Robin Haynes, um, whose book's on screen, and myself have argued that this puts his role way, way, yeah, emphasises his role way, way too much, in that the people who were in control were Parliament and the Cabinet, and it's and basically they hid behind Trevelyan in making um, their decisions. So rather than blaming Trevelyan, in order to understand what really motivated policy-making decisions, we need to look more at the Cabinet and at Parliament. Um, but um, Charles Trevelyan and um, his impact on the Irish famine literature shows you how much, when something has become a trope, how much it's difficult to dislodge it. Um, 
So uh, there was a backlash against the nationalist interpretation, which originated in the mid 20th century when Irish historians tried to apply to historical methods to the study of the Irish famine. Um, uh, these included figures such as Dudley Edwards and Williams, um, Kevin Nolan, uh, Louis Cullen and Roy Foster, and they tended to argue that the role of policy of the role of the British government was less than the nationalists traditionally described it. They argued that it was much less due to policy and many of the changes that happened to Ireland in the middle of the 19th century would have happened without the famine. So agricultural employment would have fallen as much eventually by the end of the 19th century. And there would have had to be mass emigration anyway to places where the, there were manufacturing jobs, Dublin, Belfast and cities in Britain. And many of them uh, applied mid 20th century concepts about malfusion catastrophe uh, which, which had been renamed food availability decline theory by the mid 20th century. This is the idea that the human population will grow and outgrow uh, the available food supplies. So uh, I have put a chart on the slide, which sort of shows, um, shows this graphically, or certainly Malthus's own version of this story. Um, or what he thought would happen, that you would have a population which rose geometrically, but the production of food would only rise arithmetically, and eventually the population would rise higher than the available food, um, and therefore you would end up with famine, um, starvation, poverty, etc. Now, this has been very influential among economic thinking, not only at the end of the 18th century, not only in the middle of the 20th century, but probably now, in that um, if you replace production of food with you know, produ um, you know, production of uh, renewable energy, there are those who say that we need to stop growing the economy and, um, and instead focus purely on uh, achieving net zero, who in some ways are thought of as neo-Malthusians. So um, you might think that this is a very old idea, but this is the old idea which reappears from time to time in various guises. Um, and some versions of um, you know, environmentalism are neo-Malthusian in the way they talk about how the economy, um, economic growth is bad and industrial growth is bad. Um, but this, um, the ideas and worries about Malthus and catastrophe influenced their think, the revisionist thinking, and so they saw this as inevitable, and that the famine, there was very little the British government could have done about it at the time. That, in, in turn, at the end of the 20th century, provoked a response from the post-revisionists, um, who um, challenged the idea that, you know, the famine was inevitable, this aligns with the change in the late 70s and 80s from a view of famine in the modern world as being inevitable and due to food availability to kind towards a view which saw it as preventable, avoidable, and also that you could, um, and also that um, uh, this, it wasn't due to avail food availability decline, it was due to a misallocation of resources in society, i.e. if you tax the rich and transfer the money to the poor, you could um, cure a famine in that way. And that grew up in the 70s um, and 80s, and is reflected in the Irish famine literature. The post revisionists also wanted to emphasise the emotional toll and the terrible nature of the Irish famine um, in the 80s and beyond. The revisionists have been accused of writing value-free history. Um, or not um, being able to uh, adopt an emotional tone to their writing. And that return, and the post revisionists responded to that by writing um, hist um, histories which involve you know, graphic, gory details, um, histories of emotions to convey, um, convey what Irish people and Irish nationalists have all, uh, thought about the famine since and the way that has been very emotionally traumatic for many of them. Um, and they came to the view that, yes, the British government was responsible for this, but they didn't intend it to happen. They didn't intend for Irish pop the island's population to fall like the nationalists have argued. Um, instead, this was due because of the misplaced application of an ideology called laissez-faire, 
So the idea that if you leave the economy alone, if you leave the market alone, it will produce the best outcome. They argued it said it was a misapplication of that theory, which the British government may have thought would have caused positive results to instead cause negative ones. However, the, um, the latest book in the literature, which I have to admit that I, I have written, The Great Famine in Ireland and Britain's Financial Crisis, argues that instead, it wasn't a misplaced faith in laissez-faire ideology. Instead, there was an um, in intention in the middle of the famine to increase spending on the Irish famine even further, not cut it back. And what happened in 1847 was that there was a budget disaster in early 1847, rather like the one seen in late 2022, one that panicked markets and caused um, the government then have to U-turn on its policies and implement austerity. So the February 1847 budget contained unfunded tax cuts and a announcement of a borrowing spree to pay for relief in Ireland, rather like the mini budget last autumn also contained um, tax, um, unfunded tax cuts and a borrowing spree to pay for energy um, relief. And that triggered very similar effects on the Irish, on the um, financial markets, sorry, on the modern financial markets and the markets in 1847, and both resulted in a U-turn in policy. So how can we tell that something isn't quite right with the post-revisionist interpretation? Well, the post-revisionist interpretation tends to praise Robert Peel for being very generous during the famine, being very prompt and generous in his response to the famine. He used a mixture of public works in order to provide money for people to buy food and made sure there was enough food in Ireland by importing um, food to be sold at cost price. Um, they then, the post revisionists they send the next government is, um, on the other hand, um, basically winds down those policies and um, leaves the market on its own and is much less generous than the previous government. That actually, if you look at the figures of what the government's suspending, Lord John Russell's government is actually initially far more generous than Peel's, but the spending on the Irish famine soars when um, Russell enters office compared with Peel. Albeit the, the harvest shortfall is much greater from 1846 onwards it, when that change of government occurs, but in absolute terms actually it's Lord John Russell's government which is initially very generous and it's Peel's government which is relatively skint-linked in in comparison. And indeed, if we can see any U U point where there's a U-turn, a change in policy, when the relief works are shut down, that seems to occur in the year 1847 to 1848, not 1846 and the change of government. So arguing that it's a change of government suddenly brought a group of laissez-faire ideologues into power who changed policy immediately, which is what many books about the Irish famine argue, and that's just not true if we look at the evidence of what was what was being spent. So what changed in 1847? So firstly, I don't, this is not economic policy. So believe it or not, the Lord John Russell's government was a minority government. It relies on Peel and the Peelites for its majority, and on the one hand, and also the Irish Nationalist MPs led by Daniel O'Connell were the other party it relied on for a majority in Parliament. And it's probably one of the most bizarre elements of the Irish famine that the swing votes in Parliament after 1846 were Irish Nationalist votes. And you might think it's bizarre that they didn't get a better deal for Ireland. But then again, the DUP had the swing votes between 20, 2017 and 2019 in Parliament, and yet they got Northern Ireland quite a bad deal. Um, so, so, um, so um, yes, you can have a theoretically very important role in determining policy and then misuse it. Um, and the point is um, that um, that's very much the situation going on here. So what happened in 1847 was the bu early 1847 budget, which, which was intended to increase the amount of spending on the Irish famine, backfired and caused financial markets to panic. So uh, what evidence we have that the markets did panic in response to 
um, the budget of February 1847. So in that budget, um, they announced there was going to be um, a cut in uh, import duties um, um, for the import of um, grain into the United Kingdom, which was not balanced by spending cuts. Indeed, the amount of spending was going to rise significantly to pay for Irish famine relief, and this was going to be funded by the issuance of loans. So what this did was several things, um, which can also be seen in response to this trust's mini budget in last, last autumn. Interest rates rose because if the government's going to borrow lots of money, um, um, uh, people aren't going to trust the government's going to be as secure as secure an investor. So, um, sorry, a secure uh, investment risk. And so um, investors are going to demand higher interest rates, higher return on their money. Also, if the government's going into borrow money in the financial markets, there's only going to be a certain amount of money available. So to make sure the government can fund everything it wants to spend, it has to accept a higher interest rate. Simply demand and supply of money in the market. If there is more um, demand for money in the market, to borrow money in the market, and the supply is the same, the price at which a borrower can borrow will rise. And you see that both last autumn and in the 1847 crisis as well. You also see a run on the pound in the, the amount of bullion reserves start draining from the Bank of England. That's the sterling crisis of 1847. But you also see the pound suddenly drop to its lowest ever level in the um, Monday and Tuesday after the mini budget last autumn. But also the financial system um, um, becomes unstable. So Britain got less than 24 hours away from a financial crisis um, last autumn. In 1847, there were two financial panics, one in early 1847, one in late 1847. And the really convincing evidence is that if we look at the start and stop of this panic, this precisely accords with the announcement of the budget, the announcement of the loan to fund the budget, um, and the end of the crisis, uh, which is when the government U-turns on their spending policies in Ireland, um, ends the crisis. And we can see this from what's on screen. You don't need to deeply understand what the chart is on screen. All th this is is um, one of the measures of um, a propensity of the financial system to reach a financial crisis. Um, and you can see from this that um, below is the worse it gets. And you can see um, from this that um, the budget um, knocks that off its trend right. So normally you stay around, 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 um, around zero uh, throughout the year. But as you can see, it is about zero when the budget happens. And when the budget announces, it suddenly takes a dive and it only recovers um, when there is a U-turn on Irish relief spending in the middle of April 1847. So you can see laissez-faire, the chronology doesn't work. The idea that the laissez-faire laissez government came in to implement laissez-faire policies, it doesn't work because the back government actually massive, initially massively increased spending on the Irish famine. The point is, is that this chronologically works to the week and basically to the day. Um, so, um, the point is, is that the other policies which could have been used to fund this, if you, if loans cause financial panics, if large budget deficits cause financial panics, why didn't they increase income tax? Well, the point is, is that this is not a government with a large majority. This is a government rather like Theresa May's in 2017 that doesn't have a majority and relies on other parties for its majority. So why did the other parties not support this? Um, on the one hand, the Peerlites um, weren't happy with um, import duties being cut faster than Peel's plans um, in uh, the outlines in his repeal of the court law, Corn Laws at the end of his government in 1846. Um, so he vetoed any tax rise while the government um, was playing, playing with his gradual repeal of the Corn Lords legislation because the Whigs wanted to do that faster than Peel's, Peel's plans was were. Um, there was another way that the government could have made financial crises less likely when 
the um, when borrowing, and that is introduced tax controls by reforming something known as the uh, Bank Charter Act 1844. Again, there was no parliamentary majority to do that because Peel thought that was the, his legacy that everyone would remember him ever more for the Bank Charter Act of 1844, and therefore his MPs vetoed um, changing that legislation. Meanwhile, um, the, um, the reason why the Irish nationalists didn't support the government was that there was a standoff over something called the Irish income tax exemption. So when the income tax was reintroduced in 1842, Peel excluded Ireland which remained excluded till 1852. So people resident in Ireland didn't have to pay it. And this was to avoid antagonizing Irish nationalists and increasing support for Irish nationalism. Um, you might think this is weird to have parts of the UK which didn't pay income tax. The Scilly Islands, which are parts of the UK, um, didn't pay income tax till 1953. Um, um, so um, there were these parts of the UK which didn't have to pay income tax. And the point is, is that the Whig backbenchers would only accept a higher income tax for Britain if there was the, the island's exemption was part, partially abolished. So saying that if um, if income tax was going to rise by a penny in the pound in Britain, it was also going to have to rise by a penny of the pound in Ireland. Uh, that was what Whig backbenchers demanded, and that was unacceptable to Irish nationalists. And if that makes sense if you look at who, who are the voters in Ireland at this period. And the answer is middle class and upper class people were the only people who would vote. And they're the only people who pay income tax in this period. So it was electoral suicide for Irish nationalism to give up the Irish income tax exemption. And the answer was, the, the result was is the government could not was not able to raise income tax. So Wood, um, who's pictured on the screen, had to present three budgets in 1848. The first two were rejected um, on the basis that they didn't have enough support in Parliament for tax, raise, tax rises to pay for the Irish famine, not only from British MPs, but also Irish ones as well. So what policies were put in place instead? So central government spending declined to virtually nothing after 1847 because the Chancellor of Exchequer and the Prime Minister thought they had to balance the budget in order to avoid another financial panic. It's worth remembering the previous Whig government in the late 1830s um, had also uh, suffered a series of um, financial crises, which almost financial panics, uh, which destroyed their popularity and resulted in a landslide loss in 1841. Um, and um, so they wanted to prevent this reoccurring, recurring again, um, uh, in order to you know, save their party's reputation for fiscal competence, which was already damaged in the 1830s, and um, the events of early 1847 had damaged it again. And so the arts was find another source of revenue, which was politically acceptable to Parliament. And the answer was um, the um, landlords in Ireland. So remember, the landlords didn't need to have to pay income tax. Um, so British public opinion thought that it was acceptable that they should pay through their rates, through their local property taxes, which are assessed in a similar way at that point to ha how income tax was um, income tax was calculated for uh, on agricultural land to pay for um, poverty and famine relief in the local that local area in Ireland. As um, Wood explicitly said, each farmer will have to pay his share and they had to employ labourers or pay for relief on the rate. So the idea was that um, this was, in, you know, this was a threat of government intervention in order to get people to provide employment for farmers. So either you had to employ um, the landlords in that area were expected to provide enough employment to create full employment in that area, or they would be taxed to pay for their relief. Um, by through workhouses and through local government in Ireland. And the hope was this would provoke the landlords into um, providing employment for, for um, the starving agricultural workers rather than um, the local government having to raise taxes. Unfortunately, this did not work out as planned. Um, so um, the hope for employment didn't appear. This was because many landlords in Ireland turned their land from very labour intensive potato cultivation to less labour intensive um, um, 
pastoral, so raising animals like cows and sheep and things like that, which don't don't require that many workers. Um, so the hope for employment didn't materialize. Instead, what materialized and said was extraordinarily high levels of taxes. Um, so in one part of Ireland, the tax rate reached over 170 percent um, income tax on agricultural property. Uh, and that was actually on theoretical returns from land uh, that used before the famine, before um, the collapse in potato yield to damage the value of agricultural land and the uh, actual income actually received from tenants, if you're a landlord. Um, so Bellina's Low, the, that, the rates hit 34 shillings, three and a quarter P in the pound, so over 170%. In 62 poor law unions in Ireland, so most of the west and most of the south of the country, um, tax rates reach more than 10 shillings in the pound on uh, the income from agricultural land. Um, so this is surprisingly similar to modern ideas of taxing the rich to give money to the poor. But the question is, why did it not work? This did not raise enough money. And the answer is because raising taxes beyond a certain point does not increase revenue. So there is a very close relationship, as we can see from these two charts. The top left is the theoretical position, so that's the position in economic theory. The bottom right is um, using actual data from the Irish famine. Up to about 50% tax rates rise, um, and tax rates and the revenue they produce rise at the same rate. So there's virtually no loss from um, you know, people um, avoiding or minimizing their taxes or fleeing the high tax rates. But it's when you get to 10 shillings in the pound or more than 50%, that starts to happen. People will hide their income from, or hide their wealth from the tax man. People will start emigrating, which is the big issue in the Irish famine, with their money to other places to have lower tax, to find higher returns and lower tax rates. Um, or people will stop investing because they want to protect their money from extremely high tax rates. And as you can see, that's what's going on. So as tax rates rise above 10 shillings or 50 in the pound or 50 percent, the amount of raised um, falls dramatically, the per share, um, per share collected. So you might have a tax rate, for example, to take one example, there's um, one of those dots is about on the X axis, the bottom axis is about one. So that's about one pound in every pound of income tax. But that only raises about 30% of every pound that you would expect on the other axis. Um, so they're collecting about six shillings of every pound in tax owed when the tax rate's about one pound. Whereas if tax rates, when tax rates are below 10 shillings or 50% of the pound, you collect, you actually do collect that. So if the tax rate was eight shillings in the pound, you collect about eight shillings in the pound. So the point is the tax base was just not big enough in a lot of parts of Ireland to sustain this level of famine relief spending, which suggests for taxing the poor, rich to give to the poor is not enough. You need geographical transfers from Britain to Ireland, which um, in this period are catastrophically interrupted, firstly by um, the mismanagement of the budget of uh, February 1847, the financial panics that caused in the rest of 1847, and the minority government, which cannot resolve the situation because it hasn't got a majority to change the banking legislation in Britain at the time or to raise taxes. It's also worth noting that this causes a surge in, in emigration. So there's a very close relationship, as shown by this chart, by um, between um, tax, um, tax, the amount of tax being collected in Ireland massively increasing after 1847, and this triggering a large amount of middle class emigration to North America. Uh, why does middle class emigration mainly go to North America and substantially goes to the United States? Well, um, um, firstly, you need to be quite wealthy to, uh, to afford a transatlantic travel in this period, whereas going to Britain, Great Britain, was relatively cheap as the poorest did. But also, if you fled to the United States, you could not be chased by your creditors. You could not be chased by the tax man for the money you owed. And um, believe me, the poor law unions in Ireland were chasing people around the world for the taxes that they had not paid in Ireland. But going to the United States, which was not part of the British Empire, was a way of doing this. 
And but this also explains um, why Irish Americans are so antagonistic against the British government since, in that um, they believe that they've been basically exiled from their country. And there is some evidence to say that they have, and that they they were exiles from the extremely high tax rates in the late 1840s. And uh, so their self-perception that they are exiled or were exiled during the Irish famine is probably true, but not that's not necessarily the full story of what's going on. Furthermore, there are other problems with relief policies, particularly that they um, uh, they were using the wrong foodstuff. So one of the innovative things which happened during the Irish famine was the use of Indian corn. That is a form of maize, um, which mainly is used for things like Halloween decorations these days, but was used as a foodstuff in the um, 18th and 19th centuries. The Irish famine was the first famine in Europe to use maize as the main, main relief foodstuff. And right up till today, maize has remained the staple foodstuff of famine relief efforts across the world. This was because of a, a decision made by Peel and Trevelyan, which was based on an inaccurate article um, by a scientist produced um, a few decades earlier, which argued that maize was like potatoes and that you can basically eat potatoes and a bit of milk mashed creamy mashed potato and basically eat that and nothing else and be healthy as a human and that with this article claimed there was a village in the Tyrol which did the same with maize um if this turns out to be far from accurate if you do eat sweet corn and maize and nothing else um you have a um you have a basically a, a, a nutritional deficit in that um, that doesn't have enough of, of a certain type of vegetable protein and that triggers very quickly a nutritional disease um, or set of nutritional disease called Kwashiorkor or pellagra, which very quickly um, results in death. So diet, um, diarrhea, a mixture of diarrhea, um, mental health problems um, and, um, and death soon after. And the body also swells up like this child on the, on the left body is swelling up. Um, and that's partly because of um, eating maize, um, maize as a relief food stuff. Um, and there's a very close relationship from deaths due to diarrhea during the Irish famine and the amount of corn, um, Indian corn imported into Ireland during the famine. So the point is this was a food stuff which was fought because it was a cheap replacement and a lot of it was available from America would replace potato. So it's intended to be a good substitute for potato, but in practice due to a lack of knowledge and understanding of what was going on, resulted in a suboptimal outcome. And that's very much my argument about the famine. There might have been good intentions to spend a lot of money in Ireland, but that triggered financial panic in Britain, that triggered um, capital flights and emigration in Ireland when the tax rates in Ireland were raised to pay, fund that money instead. And even the food, they didn't even pick the food stuff correctly and managed to cause a load of ex excess, higher excess deaths um, while even trying to feed people. Um, but you might ask, why, why is this relevant today? And this really does show the importance of understanding the past and you know, shattering the myths. The role of the historian is to shatter myths people tell about the past. Um, because again, we've list, lived in recent times through a situation of budget mismanagement. Um, um, in terms of the Liz Trust budget, last autumn made exactly the same mistakes as the February 1847 budget. Britain lost fiscal capacity, lost the ability to borrow as much money as it otherwise could because of a market which frightened uh, a budget which frightened investors and financial markets. The February 1847 budget, the September 2022 mini budget, both contained unfunded tax cuts and a borrowing spree, which made financial markets panicked and reduced fiscal capacity. Indeed, I had actually warned the Treasury of this in early September 2022. I gave a lecture at the Treasury on the day the Queen died, arguing that um, but basically not panicking markets, not pushing up market interest rates was a um, important thing if the trust government wanted to avoid causing a financial crisis, which would mean that they would be able to borrow the money they wanted to and would potentially end up in a political disaster for them. 
and unfortunately those those warnings were ignored and um and um the trust government did uh, trigger a financial panic britain got 24 hours from the financial crisis and it resulted in a series of policy u-turns and renewed austerity at the treasury in the autumn statement of october last year um so that that hit the that hit the headlines a um, a few weeks ago, um, um, and um, I've also brought out a second book. I thought you know my books are like buses; you have to wait a while for for any to turn up and then two turn up at the same time. About banking crises, and it was launched um, but literally the night before Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. And both Silicon Valley banks and the way banking crises are described in the books is blaming rising rapid rises in interest rates as being the cause of the two. Um, actually, the mechanism described in the book described what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, so um, I hope this shows you how important it is to understand the past uh, because because um, we historians have focused on ideas like genocide because historians have focused on ideas such as they say their ideology being responsible for the Irish famine. It had uh, it, it meant that 1847 wasn't a clear lesson for policymakers to avoid today. And that is why the 2022 mini budget disaster occurred. Likewise, because historians had misunderstood um, the, how banking crisis occurred in Britain over the past 200 years, uh, policymakers haven't been interested in interest rate risks, and that contributed both towards the 2022 midgey budget disaster, as well as the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the banking panic we've been living through over the past two weeks. So I hope that this, this lecture has introduced you to giving you a taste of what studying history at university is like as well as giving you a taste of why history and what historical research at Cambridge, how that um, the sort of research we do at Cambridge um, has relevance for the present day and indeed is of relevance to policymakers and the policy making process today. So at that point, I'm going to ask whether anyone's got any questions. Hi, Charles. Um, thanks you very much for that. I think one of uh, a couple of questions that are similar have come in, and I'm going to sort of put them together. Which is, uh, someone asked, "How did you get interested in economic history?" And as an extension, how did you get interested in Irish history? Um, two interesting questions, and probably two, two actually two two separate questions. Um, um, so, um, how did I get interested in eco eco economics? So uh, I think that was probably reading The Economist every day at um, at school in the school library at the um, uh, end of the day. Um, and um, I think I got interested in economic history basically right at the end of my A-levels in that I didn't think I was uh, going to be an economic historian at the start of, uh, you know, when I was 16 or 17. Instead, I thought my interest lied primarily in political history, and to some extent they still do. Um, but it was only that I accidentally ended up being um, doing much better in my economics A level than I did in history. Um, um, when I suddenly realized, ah, oh, economic history, I find I've, I've got a comparative advantage when it comes to um, economic history. Um, um, economic history and, and it was something I really basically discovered at university so I think that was that was that was um, what drove that interest but what also drove it was that uh, Lehman Brothers collapsed the biggest one of the biggest banking collapses and um, the global financial crisis occurred in freshers week the first week of my time at university and I mean the financial crisis has had an impact on everything since so the reason why Britain has had basically no growth since 2008 was because of the global financial crisis. It is the defining um, financial crisis, the economic crisis of 2008 has been the defining moment in um, certainly um, um, in certainly the adulthood of my, my generation um, in that this has stopped the British economy growing ever since. Um, so that 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 explains my interest in firstly in economic history, but then secondly, particularly in financial crises. These are important in history. Um, these um, destroy economic growth. They also cause political extremism, and you can see this move to political extremes: um, Trump, Brexit, 
uh, the far right in continental Europe as being driven, this is a response to financial crises. And this has happened after financial crises in the past may happen after the most recent financial crisis. Um, why Irish history? Um, that is a long, um, that is a long story. I think I ended up writing about Irish history um, because I found a diary of Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in the 1840s in an archive when trying to find the subject to do for my BA dissertation. It was a 107,000 word diary explaining his reasons for every decision he made that came through his bread boxes. So Minister of the Crown gets their paperwork to go through in wet boxes. And basically this is a explanation or his defense of every decision he made in three years in office in five volumes, 107,000 word, words. There isn't a document like it for any other politician in 19th century Ireland. And that got me interested in going down the Irish history route. So that was simply archival discovery got me into Irish history. Okay. Um, Ruben asks, how many modules are available at Cambridge on Irish history? Oh, we have we have quite a lot now. So we have a, a first year course um, called Modern Britain and Ireland, and we teach Iron, Irish and British history together, basically saying Irish history is important to understand British history and British history is important to understand Irish history in first year. Um, we also have several papers um, for third years. We have one um, about Ireland and um, the Irish since uh, the Great Famine in third year. We also have another one um, called Parnell, um, Parnell Speeches, um, which is uh, the History Faculty's first digital humanities paper. So this is analyzing Parnell Speeches using quantitative techniques, um, such as topic modeling, um, and doing things such as um, counting how often he's using certain words, how, how, um, how long are his sentences, um, how often does he talk about certain themes quantitatively using computational methods? And these computational methods are um, used in marketing, advertising, social media, um, to so that to, so tech firms can work out what people are saying about them on social media. So these are real like world skills, but are applied by in the digital humanities to um, historical texts. And um, there's a course on that which teaches you how to do digital humanities, how to use corpus linguistics, using the speeches of Charles Parnell, who is a home, um, home rule leader. So there's that option as well. In history and politics, there's always Irish history questions in some of the coursework options as well. And of course, you can pick to do a dissertation on Irish history or a um, issue which touches on Irish history if you wishes to. So there's plenty of plenty of Irish history to do at Cambridge. Although there is no compulsion to do Irish history if you your your um, interests lie elsewhere. Great. Um, Christopher asked. I think it's going back to the nationalists' uh, concept of what was happening during the Irish famine. He said, "Could you just briefly elaborate on what the exact policies the nationalists accused the English of doing during the famine?" Well, it depends on which nationalist you do. Um, you do. Um, you, 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 um, you know, you're looking at, if you're looking at John Mitchell, what he's saying during the famine is essentially saying that, um, that uh, the government is, um, is, is taxing the middle classes and spending, using that money to feed um, the poor, whereas the middle classes are more important than the, the poor and therefore should be prioritized. You know, they're, they're the group which croach should be most be cherished. He also blames um, um, Jews being admitted into parliament for, uh, what sort of goes on during the government's policies during the Irish famine. That is Mitchell in the 1840s. In the 1860s, after he um, has a long exile in various places around the world, um, um, returns to um, and um, spends time in America um, and is influenced by um, uh, various other ideas. And in the 1860s, um, he comes to blame it on um, the use of laissez-faire ideology by the British government to deliberately reduce the Irish population using laissez-faire, i.e. Um, doing nothing as the, as the tool or leaving it to the market as the tool to do that. So there is an evolution of Irish nationalist views between the 1840s, which is very much the focus is on making sure Ireland doesn't pay high tax rates to the 1860s, where instead you blame it on laissez-faire ideology. Um, as a historian looking back, you might be able to um, 
look, see the cog cognitive dissidence between those two views. One hand is saying there's too much government intervention in the 1840s. By the 1860s, they're saying there's not enough. Um, so this is why you need to take both of those views, um, be critical of both of those views, and so think there's something else going on here that they're not wanting to talk about. So often you have to think about what people are talking about in the past. You also have to think about what silences are in people's interpretations of the past as well in order to be a good historian. Um, we've got loads of questions, Charles, but I'm also conscious of, of time because we've got the undergraduates waiting. But um, I'll, I'll try and pick some that I think are particularly interesting. So Jessica asks, um, was there ever a socialist or Marxist movement in Ireland that originated from the economic crisis? And that's an interesting question. Of course, 1848 is the moment where communism, you know, com com communism takes off the, um, um, uh, the Communist Manifesto is published, um, um, etc. Um, but um, uh, one of the interesting features of Irish politics is that basically it's one country in Europe where socialism and Marxism doesn't really get anywhere. Um, you know, the two big Irish political parties of the 20th century are broadly centrist or centre-right parties. Sinn Féin has shifted to the left and is um, gaining in the polls in recent years. But that is Ireland, if, if that wins power, that will be, uh, you know, Ireland potentially in the next election, that will be Ireland's first uh, left-wing government, basically, since Ireland gained independence. There were socialists, there were Marxists, the um, 1916 Easter Rising was um, uh, led by basically left-leaning people of the Irish Home Rule movement, but they were actually the, those who weren't shot or killed in 1916 became very disappointed with the state which was created in 1922, which tended to be centrist, centre-right, even more small c conservative than than Britain was. In that, um, one of the first you know early things the newly independent Irish Free Irish State did was ban divorce. Uh, ban contraception, um, both of which were legal in um, the United Kingdom before Ireland became independent. So a lot of them became very disillusioned with that, you know, with um, what I, independent Ireland had become. Um, but at the time, there wasn't left wing or Marxist reaction to what was going on. I mean, it was middle class um, reactionary um, nat nationalism, which was what, what was substantially going on during the famine. Um, I suppose, if we're putting it in Marxist term, it took more time for class consciousness to appear after, after the publication of Marx's and Engels' work. 